Hi, everyone. I want to take a few minutes to welcome you all here. Such a great opportunity to be in community with you. Uh, before I have our guests introduce themselves, I just want to uh, tell you the story of how we are how we are all connected uh, and, and why, why it's important for us to be together today. Uh, my name is Mel Fillmore. I am a second year PhD student from Boise State University in the School of Public Service. I'm studying public policy and administration. My focus being U.S. policy on American Indigenous peoples and conversely, uh, how American Indigenous people are participating in public policy. And uh, I really want to share my relationship to uh, my colleague and my dear one of my dearest friends, um, Hanako Wakatsuki. Um, her friendship is one of the most important of my life. And what's interesting is my relationship with her is directly tied to uh, our ancestral um, history with regard to U.S. policy, removing our our communities and and um, impacting our, you know, the way our citizenship is is configured in in the United States. And um, one of, one specific point is is um, that one of the authors of the War Relocation Authority, um, the author of those policies, uh, Dylan S. Meyer, became in charge of the BIA and was in charge of the termination and relocation. And so the whole, the, the, the policies uh, related to termination and relocation of, of terminating American Indian status and, and tribes um, and removing them to cities was, is the sister policy to the, the same, it is the same administrative policy that, that remove Japanese American people to internment camps uh, and sites on federal land, which was often um, indigenous land. And through Hanako, we've connected so much on, on the story of our ancestors living through those experiences. Um, the purpose of that, this of today is to, to honor and recognize all marginalized communities who experience state oppression and we recognize state oppression as a global phenomenon, communicating uh, economic and, and political, historical and social, spiritual ways. Marginalization and oppression has, sh has, has shaped humanities and collective experiences. And it requires a deep commitment to conversations and a, a continual practice of acknowledging our, our lived experiences with marginalization. Um, our panel hopes to move through the settler colonial tools of internal divisions and, and state policies and categorizations that often place communities in deep and harmful places that exacerbate collective pain and trauma. And one thing our panel hopes to do is to serve as, a, as an experience toward uh, collective solidarity where we can communicate uh, the stories and the history of oppression across our communities into a future, um, into a future place. And, we envision truth and justice rooted in the stories of our ancestors and shared and that our stories of, of the ways our communities have been impacted by state oppression. And so it is with great pleasure and honor that I am spending time with this these community of folks and I'd really like our panelists to introduce themselves and uh, the communities that they come from. So Alicia, if you wanna start. Hi, thank you, Mel. Uh, my name is Alicia Deegan. I'm a citizen of the Mandan Hidatsa Rikura Nation in North Dakota. And I work for the National Park Service at Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site. Albert, do you want to take a... Thanks. Um, <clears throat> my name is um, Pasa Mielo. Um, my name is Albert LeBeau. I'm an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. Uh, I'm currently the acting uh, tribal liaison for the Office of American Indian Affairs for DOI 3, 4, and 5. And uh, <laughs> my real job is the Cultural Resource Program Manager at Effigy Mounds National Monument. Um, I do apologize. I have a I have a bit of a frog in my throat, so. Thank you, Albert. Take away, Dorothy. Hey, thank you. 
Um, my name is Dorothy Firecloud, and I am a member of the Rosewood Sioux Tribe from South Dakota. Um, I'm a mother and a grandmother, and um, um, I most my most recent job within the National Park Service is that of Native American Affairs Liaison, which is an assistant position to the director of the National Park Service. And I've been in this position for almost a year, and prior to that, I was superintendent at Montezuma Castle and Tusi Ute National Monuments in Arizona, and then Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming before then. So it's good to be here. Thank you all. So, uh, and it's also such a pleasure to be with um, not just tribal folks that are, are working in, in um, you know, federal positions, and so it's just such a pleasure to be with folks, uh, indigenous people who are working in these positions and, and folks from my from my own tribal homelands. Um, I'm Hung Papa Lakota from Standing Rock Sioux Tribe of, on the South Dakota side. And so my first question for you all is, um, you know, how do we recognize our own stories in the stories of other community oppressions? Okay, so um, I think, you know, as you're growing up, you, know, you kind of hear stories about what's going on, but you don't really recognize how it might you might be impacting one another. And I think it really came to bear most recently for me um, when all of the stories started coming out with the Asian Americans being attacked and a lot of it having to do with COVID and stuff. And I think I started like really thinking about it more from that point of view. And at the same time, um, you know, um, working with, um, you know, I've been a member of CIRCLE, which is the employee resource work group within the National Park Service for um, tribal NPS um, employees. And we had recently been working with the employee work group that was being developed for Asian Americans. And so we've been working together very closely the last, I'm thinking, like two years. Um, Alicia can talk about that a little bit more because she was pretty involved with it. But um, one of the days I was reading up and kind of getting a little bit more um, depth into the boarding school initiative and all that's going on with that. And then just going back and looking at some of the boarding schools. And there was a story that had, that had popped up about one of the um, former boarding schools that had um, buildings that had been used had also been used to house um, or to, you know, for the Japanese Americans when they were interned. And just thinking about the trauma that was left within that building originally from having those young kids be there, you know, in the boarding school era. And then, you know, so there's all of that trauma that's left in that building. And then, you know, they're all removed. And then this whole other group of minority people are brought in, you know, being traumatized, you know, by being taken away from their homes and their businesses and everything over something that they had no control over. And then being put into this building that already has all of this trauma that had been a part of its history. And then I was thinking of from, from a grandmother's perspective and going into, into those kind of buildings and being able to feel all of that trauma that had originally happened there. And then, and then that being like kind of like compounded upon the trauma that they're already going through originally, you know, by being removed from their homes and stuff. It was just, I mean, it's just really difficult when you start thinking about all the things that minority people have, have had to go through. So. I also think part of it is that, you know, we were the original, um, you know, the, the Native Americans or, or American Indians, you know, we were the first ones to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, you start from looking at Meadowcroft, you know, in the Maritimes in Canada, and you go all the way to what happened um, to the California tribes, and then even further than that to um, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islands as well. Um, you know, they practice on us until they got it right to do it to other people. Um, you know, the ideas of internment camps came from the idea of putting us on reservations. You know, that was a direct 
correlation on you know um, uh, American policy towards those who are different than the norm uh, or what is perceived to be the norm um, and you know it is a shared trauma um, and you know when we when we think about that it is you know um, you know they like you guys said they practice on us first um, and and yet we survived just as other marginalized quote unquote marginalized populations have survived um, and that is you know one of the benefits of of being a marginalized group is that we have survived and we will continue to survive you know, going into the next century mm -hmm. um, to, to think about your question is how do we recognize our own stories in this time of oppression that's some that's a huge uh, thing and I feel like as indigenous people, we know our stories, we recognize it, but there's also that that was set in place that Albert and Dorothy were talking about is that removal, that policy to destroy our culture as native people. And it is in that concept and that idea is why you know we do the work we do within the park service is to help put those stories out there of the oppression to tell the full history of where we're at at these sites and what that means what that looks like going all the way back to who was on this land to begin with and having the ability and the responsibility as managers and as leaders, you know, we need to tell those stories in all of them. And just because they will feel uncomfortable to people, it is good to sit in some uncomfortableness to actually make some positive change. And I appreciate this platform to be able to speak to other people that understand what that means and what that looks like so that we can go forward together to create a place where that next generation will not have to go through what we are going through just like the people before us it, it makes it easier every single time so this is that's a really good question yeah thank you thank you all for your for this i one of the things i I think when I think of uh, the places that we do share these stories, I, th I often think of sitting with, um, you know, my my aunties or in ceremony, uh, or um, sitting with relatives who are about to 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 go through Sundance. Or those those are the sacred places where we often hear the hardest stories of our, you know, the the trials that our ancestors went through. And I, you know, it wasn't until um, you know being in college and again bringing talking with Hanako and uh, learning about the practice of, of pilgrimages, where, where her community gets to come to these places of the, the, the land of the trauma, uh, you know, of the places where this stuff was, was perpetrated and that history to be, um, to be revisited, but, but to be contextualized over and over again is such a, a practice that I, I am so inspired by um, the, the the historic preservation work, but also, um, you know, letting the letting the people who have experienced that firsthand and and the families, right, um, because we carry those stories with us, and um, and our children, you know, carry those stories with us um, throughout. And I really appreciated Dorothy's, you know, comment, you know, reflecting on uh, being a grandmother um, and and tying um, your story through. Um, that this isn't just one one generation; it, it impacts multiple generations. That's something I um, I also appreciate about the Japanese American um, preservation experience. It's about their younger generations being told that that history and um, that history being shared with them as well. And one of the most important things that I think came out of our our group chat when we when we when we first met was. 
um, you know, the collective experiences we've had, um, you know, not only knowing our ancestral histories, but um, knowing that the work that we do in, in the, in, in, um, I'm in academia, but the rest of you are in National Park Service and doing this work is your collective just knowledge navigating these systems and it can be really hard. And so the next question that I have is, um, you know, Alicia brought this up was, you know, a, mo a huge motivating factor in why we still continue to do this work even in the face of oppression and uh, ask you to, um, you know, um, what do you, um, how do you feel about that and how do you navigate that, um, that work? I'll let one of the youngsters take the lead on this one. <laughs> can, you, can you repeat the question? Why do we still do this in the <laughs> face of so much oppression? Because <laughs> yeah. Dorothy said I had to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Auntie said so. Auntie Dorothy here. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I think it, it really is because of the fact that, I mean, you know, you know, we're, t we're getting ready to do um, November, which is Native American month coming up. And so we were talking about different themes and what we should do and stuff. And Albert, you know, kind of came up with a really good idea because, you know, when we're in these positions, we're really walking in two worlds. And it, and it, and it does get difficult because I remember one time being in a meeting in Santa Fe. And this is when I worked with U.S. Forest Service as a regional liaison down there. And they had like breakout rooms for everybody to go to. And so, you know, I um, wanted to go into one of these rooms, but the breakout rooms were like for the tribal folks. And so, you know, I still, I'm a federal employee, but I'm native. I'm a member, you know, the Rose tribe. And so, you know, I went into one of the meetings and, and was told, you know, you really can't be here because you're a fed. And, you know, so you get that kind of a pushback. But at the same time, we all recognize how important it is to have Native people working inside, you know, so that we can push telling the stories, helping tribal people not be invisible any longer, you know. Um, and, you know, when we do, um, you know, I just got off listening to a tribal consultation um, meeting that was going on before I joined you guys. And, um, you know, that that it was one of the um, things that was mentioned was it wasn't until 1924 that tribal people were even recognized to be human. We were you know, considered subhuman or not in you know, before 1924. And it wasn't until different laws were passed. And then it wasn't what until like in the 1960s, almost before we were able to vote and stuff. And so, you know, from that point of view and then um, you know, we're working with a woman native right now to try to um, develop a, a partnership of how we can work together to help tell the stories, the stories beyond the wars, beyond the Indian wars of tribal people, the fact that we're still here. And within the National Park Service, we have a lot of signage um, where you'll go into parks and there'll be a sign that will say, we're still here and talk a little bit about the tribes that are located in around the park or within the park and um, talk about the consultations that we're doing. But then we stop, we have, we don't, we're not good at telling the current stories of tribal people, you know, the contemporary stories of tribal people, how successful, you know, a lot of tribal people are, how successful a lot of tribes are. Um, the fact that, you know, and, um, we only have one park unit that even comes close to being able to tell that story, which is Alcatraz. And Alcatraz, you know, there's nothing within its legislative history that says anything about tribal people, but yet Alcatraz has a rich history of tribe, of tribes and different events. You know, most, the, the one that's known the most is the occupation that happened. And, and, but, even there, we talk about the occupation and what happened during that time, but we don't talk about what resulted of that occupation. The fact that President Nixon 
was in office, the fact that you know he had a football coach in college that was native that influenced how he looked at Indian people. So when he was in office, he was able to change a lot of things. You know, a lot of people don't like Nixon because of what happened and stuff. But when you look at, at what all he did for Native people, it's pretty rich. And it really turned the history of this country and how, you know, up, up, up until that time, it was all about termination. You know, so there's a lot of people going into the cities, you know, taking um, adults, Native American adults from reservations and putting them to all these different cities throughout the country and hoping that they would just become mainstream and that eventually the reservations would go away. Just like with blood quantum, you know, blood quantum is something that's really argued amongst tribal people, but it's a colonialistic approach of getting rid of tribal people because it's, there's no other race of people that has to show how much what you know like you know like dogs or horses this is my degree of blood you know in order to be a member of this of this tribe but yet we have internalized that so much that a lot of people then say well you're you know you're not full blood you're only half blood so then you have you know to deal with all of that back home and stuff and so, you know, there's, we, we need to remember that as tribal people, but going back to Alcatraz, so what happened as a result of Alcatraz was the fact that um, Nixon then turned it to become self-determination. But we need to tell that story there. So that's one of the things that we're working on is to start telling more of those stories to look, we're doing an internal um, gap analysis to see where we're missing parts, what stories are we not telling, and it's everything tribal, you know, beginning with the end of the Indian Wars forward that that we still need to tell. So. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that um, through my experience of why why we still do this, um, and I know it's it's kind of a very personal. Like everybody, we each have our own reason why we um, stick in here and i think we've all had that discussion of um or i should rephrase that we've all had one of us talk each other down from saying i just i've had enough because it gets to a point where you get really jaded and so remembering why you still do this work and it's for those that future generation and to honor the people that came before us and the work they did. And so when I give my one minute elevator speech to those younger generations that are coming up, it's it's that. It's like, there's gonna be days where you're just like, what am I doing? <laughs> and then you're gonna remember all of the people and just going back even hundreds of thousands of years, we're here because of them and we have to continue. And that was something my husband sent to me the other night, because it's been such a difficult, just even this week has been so difficult. And uh, <laughs> um, he's like, when, when our ancestors left the villages here that I'm at my site after smallpox, because of the hurt and the pain that ha they had lived through those years before they went, he's like, he, we are the answers to their prayers. Now here's one of the tribal members as a superintendent of this site and we're living here. And it's like that, that right there that we can say this to the people like here we are. And when Mel, when you talked about Hanako and her position, like how powerful is that for us as indigenous people, as people of color that we can say we're sitting in these positions that we can help now change the policy, change the way things happen so that the next generation, the generation after, don't have it as hard as we did. And so that is why I stay here, even after some crazy stuff happens at work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. I I keep thinking about, um, uh, I am really interested in, in the way that um, data shapes um, what, you know, what policy says about American Indian people. And, you know, one of the ways that's configured is, of course, you know, uh, you know, census data and 
they're so, you know, there's no, you know, the census data says, you know, just Native American people. And, and one of the things that, that, that data says is, is that 75% of Native people live in cities. And it's like, we don't, that doesn't say anything about where people have come from. It doesn't say anything about there are individual communities. And what's fascinating to me is, and what I'm hearing from all of you is um, that deep connection to the your ancestral homelands and that collective knowledge that you bring to the work that you do now is such a part of that story. And that's not the story that's told in, in mass data, right? And, and, and these national ways of, of being and knowing, right? And so my, I've always wanted to see people like me working in, in spaces and I'm, and I'm always interested in the, how they, how they made, how they made that happen. Right. And, and so I'm, my third question is directly tied to this. Like who, who is an ancestor that has inspired your, your current work in, and your, in your life path? Um, I would have to say it's probably my grandmother. You know, my grandmother raised us um, down by the river, no, you know, no running water, no electricity, none of none of the amenities that we have today. And um, I mean, she did an awesome job. You know, she's she still impacts the way that I do things today, mostly by scaring me. <laughs> there are so many of us that when we were little, that she would use spirits and ways, you know, um, have fear in us and stuff. And I ever so often I'll do something, I'll remember, oh my gosh, I'm still, you know, she's still controlling me, you know, how I'm behaving today and making sure I'm not doing something really stupid <laughs> stuff. So, yeah, but so I'd have to say it's, for me, it's my grandmother and stuff. Um, I think for me, it's, I walk in the shadows of my ancestry. Um, and, you know, uh, I come from a long lineage of, of great people and the fact that they were able to survive and in some cases not survive. Um, I've had relatives that are buried at Wounded Knee. I have relatives who are part of the Dakota 38, um, you know, and it's it's even up until you know my parents generation my parents were the first people from my reservation to get their post baccalaureate degrees and my dad was the first one to get his phd so you know i i walk in the shadow of those people and you know that's what inspires me to keep going because um I have, I mean, in my opinion, um, there's a saying, you know, you know, we, we try to be humble and, you know, for me, I'm humbled by my ancestry and I'm humbled by my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, great, greats, great, great, greats, great, 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 greats. And for me, that what keeps me going and then also i'm a grandparent so i have to look after and prepare the world for my grandchildren as they grow up and as they're mixed race and as they grow up and understand that they are going to be walking in two worlds whether they like it or not <laughs> Um, I guess I would have to say, along with um, both of Dorothy and what Albert say, it's um, there's so many people that are still alive, but and then people that are not. Along, and along with my uh, grandpas, that really um, have influenced me. And um, there, I had I had a dream like ten years ago, and this dream is when I was at Mount Rushmore and the superintendent at the time is um, an individual from my tribe. And in the dream, he had this huge fire in the middle of his office that just certain people were helping to keep going. 
and I had come to him and he was talking about going up to North Dakota to help with an archeological dig that was along the knife and then the Heart River. And I said, that's, that's our people. He's like, can, and I asked him, can I go? And he didn't answer at first. And then I asked again and he said, yes, you can go, but you have to do these things. So it wasn't then until four years later that I was, then I moved to here to this site. So I feel like I've, I've always had my ancestors watch over me, but I've had individuals in my life that have provided opportunities and those lessons that I've learned um, from my from my grandparents is, you know, is to be thankful and, you know, take advantage of those opportunities when you can. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say that my my father's so my my father was removed from from his mother um, and my father is a um, is half native, half white, and um, was removed from the, tri the the reservation from away from my grandmother when he was three, at a time when she she had no rights to you know they didn't recognize you know the rights of of indigenous mothers, um, especially if you were unmarried, and so no no way for her to um, have a relationship with my father and. He didn't end up going back until much later in life. Um, and what's interesting is my grandmother ended up working for ICWA, um, bringing children back home to uh, our reservation. And when I think about that story and, and her life experience, um, she was a mother who had lost her children in that, you know, and, and to be able to return children to families uh, knowing um, knowing firsthand that experience of, of what it meant to lose your children and to be able to bring that. Um, oh, ICWA, yes, thanks. Uh, thank you, Albert. Um, ICWA is the, is the Indian Child Welfare Act, which previous to 1970, um, it was legal for American Indian children to be adopted off the reservation or away from families. So. Um, if the state deemed families um, incapable of caring for their children, which at the time was um, there, there are a lot of um, issues with that, with the removal of, of children, American Indian children from their families, and which is also a, a state adoption, um, a state process right of of recognizing humanity of of um, indigenous children and what's also interesting about um ICWA and the connection to I, i'm not sure if any of you are aware of this i i only became aware of this very recently but um even japanese american orphan children were removed to uh internment camps and so the idea that um the identification of children and removing children from spaces that the state um, deemed necessary is still, um, and when we think about our politics of, of removing families from children uh, and, and our borders, these are all connected policies that have been administrative, you know, patterns, right? That that are um, the state is engaged in. So, so thank you, Albert. Um, I think my favorite question that I would like to ask you all um, is what do you want to share about your work experiences to folks that they might not know about about your about your job or your work or your experiences? <laughs> I don't know if we have enough I don't know if there's enough enough time. Howard, we got 30 <laughs> minutes left. I'll 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 defer to uh, a person who is older than I. Okay. 
Yeah, um, state your question again so I make sure I get it all right. Yeah. Um, what do you wish people knew about your work that they might not know? Oh, God. I mean, how interesting it is. I think and not only how interesting, but how valuable it can be at different times to helping tribal people move forward with, with what needs to be done uh, you know, as a whole. We, um, I, think, I think probably my favorite part of the job throughout my career is helping um, Native people come into the Park Service and helping to make sure you know, that we help one another. Um, but also w within the National Park Service, there's a lot of youth programs. And through the youth programs, I think that we're able to make quite a bit of difference within a lot of Native people's lives, especially Native youth. Because I mean, with the rate of suicide and the hopelessness that people can feel at times and stuff, I think that those programs can really make a difference in how um, how you know how they approach life at times, and we're I think being able to make progress within the National Park Service by helping a lot of the tribal youth also reconnect to places. Um, you know, I said earlier that I had served as superintendent at Devil's Tower National Monument, which is a significant sacred area, you know, the whole entire Black Hills is a significant um, site or area landscape for tribal people. But um, we we worked with the Forest Service and we would bring in um, youth crews every summer and stuff. And, and part of it, we would make sure that they would get, um, that they weren't working in like eight hours a day and stuff. But we also made sure that they were able to enjoy the, the um, park and get some educational value, you know, so we would take them around and do different things with them and stuff. And I, and I really hope that a lot of those um, um, opportunities for the youth have made a difference in their lives and stuff. And I think that's one of the things that, um, that people don't really think about as much. And there's a new um, program that's coming up, the Indian Youth Service Corps that just passed last year. And that's specific to Native, um, Native American youth, Native Hawaiians, and South Pacific Islanders um, to help get um, youth crews come, coming back into the parks that will be specific to for direct hire authority for the Native Americans, Native Hawaiian, and Southern Pacific Islander youth to work in the parks. And I'm um, really looking forward to that. We're getting ready to publish the um, implementation guidance here soon. And then um, really looking forward to how we can get that funding out to the different communities. And there's a lot of different uh, the conservation corps, you know, that are working with the parks. The ancestral lands crew is one that's I think making a huge difference in a lot of um, young people's lives and stuff. So I think from that perspective, that we are really making a positive difference too. But it's something that people don't really see that you know that we're working on and stuff. But it's it's kind of it's there. I think part of my issue is that I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a, <laughs> I joke around a lot um, because that's who I am. But <laughs> you know, usually when I when I do introductions at meetings or or if I'm giving a class, I introduce myself as a as a walking oxymoron, or just a moron. And the reason I say that is because um, I'm a Native American archaeologist. Um, archaeology in, in in Indian country, you know, isn't look, looked upon very well um, when I first started. It's getting way better um, now. But when I first started, way back when, um, it, you know, I've been called a trained pot hunter on count on my council floor by my relatives who wanted me to go to college to get my degree in archaeology. <laughs> so, um, and the thing that helps me, or the thing that is, is kind of surprising for people to find out, is in both the positions that I current that I have now. Um, I actually get to be an advocate for tribes. 
Um, the role that I look at is I'm in place, whether I'm the cultural resource program manager, you know, making sure that we follow our consultation mandates under the law versus as a Native American liaison, um, I get to advocate for our tribes to ensure that we, the National Park Service, are living up to our words, which are the law, that we are following the law. Um, because of that historic trauma that I have with the with that my ancestries ancestors had to had to deal with with broken treaties and the government not being honest with them ever and my work working for my tribe before I worked for the park service and fighting with the government and making sure that they followed the law um, when I used to work for the tribe, I always used to tell that whatever agency I worked for or was working against was, these are your words, not mine. You have to follow your words. Because if it was up to me, I'd do it a different way, but these are your words. So you will follow the law or we will sue you. So on the other side of it, I said, these are our words. If you don't, if we don't follow our words, they're going to turn around and sue us. <laughs> So what do you want us to do? It's your decision, but here are the options, you know, and that is what I get to do now. And um, that is probably one of the more surprising things, even to myself anymore, is that I get to do that, so. Um, I don't know if there's anything really too surprising, but the things that I really like about the job that is not something that you would associate with um, the position that I am right now, um, maybe more the employee resource group that we are a part of, which is the Council for Indigenous Relevance, Communication, Leadership and Excellence, also known as CIRCLE, um, is that reaching out and being that safe space for other Native people because it can get really isolating in the parks that you're at. You may be the only person of color in the, maybe even in the town that you <laughs> live at. Like there's probably just not a lot of people. So being able to have that community within the workplace is so comforting to say, oh, this just happened to me. I know it's not, nothing's gonna go anywhere, but I know that this person can, can relate to what I'm saying. And, and then it's just like, then being able to help those younger people. I just had a, a really good discussion with a young lady that works at Grand Tetons and she is a young native lady and really wants to work for the park service. And I just was really honest with her. Like there's gonna be days that is so tough, but you gotta remember why you're here and why you wanna do it. And it's, it's, it's those moments that we can provide that community. And that's the thing that I really like the most about our job. And then through this, where, where we were able to do this program today is finding that commonality with, with, with what Hanako was going through and be able to relate and say, yes, this is extremely unfair. How can we help each other? Those are those moments that are like, this is why it is so important and why we're here. And, just kind of those things that you normally don't think of other than payroll and nothing's burning down. And like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I, um, when I, I, uh, yeah, I, I'm a second year PhD student. So it's, uh, <laughs> Um, I'm in a predominantly white institution. So Albert, I can definitely relate to uh, your family being like a political scientist. What the heck are you doing with political science and public policy? And uh, I get asked if I'm gonna be a politician, which that, I, nothing makes me want to uh, vomit more than 
being the, the idea of running for office. You be a chairwoman. <laughs> Even when, <laughs> uh, um, I would say one of the things I I cherish most about being um, and and in my work with Hanako, especially learning the the um, you know public history side of of her work, is just learning how learning people our stories, learning from each other and. I'm so amazed by um, and and Dorothy, thank you so much for bringing up um, you know the the his you know that we need to work on <laughs> advocating for our history from the from the Indian Wars on right like people who have been doing this work um, you know since well right with our ancestors but um, I think that there's not enough a preservation of the stories of of folks who are doing the work right now and um, you know and I. Uh, and Sarah Deer, who is a, a Muskogee Creek lawyer, works on, um, I work on mostly domestic violence policy and um, I'm working on study with missing and murdered indigenous people in, in Idaho currently. Um, I'm so amazed by the, the stories of, you know, our service providers our you know, our tribal domestic violence service providers and the folks that hear the stories of our people of, of violence, you know, on a on a regular basis and who preserve those stories, who honor those stories, who tell those stories, who are um, no, no, in carry, you know, they're the, the story carriers of our people, how little recognition sometimes they get. And, and so I'm here, I uh, just really want to thank you all for, for being in, in community today and to, uh, to share a little bit of that story and for our, allowing me to facilitate this conversation. I, uh, from the moment we spent time together uh, with Hanako, our first meeting together, I was just so honored that she would put us in a room together and to be able to hear each other's stories is just um, is truly inspirational. And I hope that we we can keep in touch. And um, and that is all that we have for today. We're supposed to see something. Hi. I think we're reading. Uh, oh, <laughs> we're looking for some questions, I suppose. I, let's see. I know we just had the one from um, BB Brigman that talked about um, how can white allies effect change at the National Park Service? to help management better recognize and respectfully share these non-white history and honor sites of oppression? Which I think is really a great question. Um, you know, and Albert had a response. I'll let Albert talk first. I think part of it was, um, you know, being open and honest about either the site or the story that the site tells um and tell the entire story if we don't know the entire story you know do your research um and then you know interact and um and, and develop relationships with those non-white um people who who know the story and then listen um a lot of the things within within um a lot of communities is that you know you listen and that's how that's how we learn um and um you know that's 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 the one thing that that i always tell people is like, just be honest with the story you know and, and tell the whole story dorothy did you want to respond Okay, there, I was looking for my, my mute button. Um, one of the places I think that allies can go to is Illuminative 
So it's L I L L U M I and then native with a capital N N A T I V E dot org. And they've done some comprehensive stories or no um, studies about um, the invisibility of native people. And, and in response to the study that they did, they've also done additional um, reports about one that's specific to allies and what allies can do to help with that struggle and to help um, native people become visible again. So there's a whole report there that I would recommend that people go take a look at that report. That's pretty good. And they also have a follow-up report as well on how native people can do things to assist with telling the stories and getting those stories out there so that native people are not invisible. And you know, a huge part of it, I think, is the responsibility of the Park Service because as you know, as America storytellers, who else should be the ones to lead that than, than us at the various park units where we're able to tell those stories? Lisha, do you want to add? Yeah, um, just one thing I, I to add as an ally is um, a lot of times the the voices of indigenous people um, aren't heard, and allies' voices can um, help open that door in, in that sense of being able to get that topic on the table, and then you have the people come in. So it, it allies are very important. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that history and being respectful um, and, and knowing that things that are written down in books, not everything should be talked about at parks. So having that open dialogue and conversations with tribal partners is really important. I always invite folks to uh, Google or, you know, do the reading and do it from, you know, find the sources that the community uses to uh, preserve that history, find scholars that that community approves of and, and ask those questions because we we know who the stories are, storytellers are and, and what uh, sources are important to us. And, um, and I, I know that that's also true for Japanese American in, in in their preservation circles as well there's there's important conversations to be had with those communities with with permission and with um, you know in context and relationship to land and, and uh, family mm -hmm. yeah so it's, so far that's the only question that's come in so we must have done a pretty good job with the initial part of the of the show. Yeah, so I know um, this week they're having, um, I think about four or five different sessions on um, interpretive, um, um, like what can we do to change things within our interpretive programs. So if people have gotten in th that invite or, um, you know, please be able to, you know, to try to get to at least one of the sessions so you can help with, you know, with telling these stories and bring it up that you know there's still a lot more that really needs to be told when it comes to working with Native peoples and the people that have been there. Um, we're getting ready um, when you know November is Native American month and so we're getting ready to do different webinars and things during the month and so one of them is going to be on land acknowledgements within the National Park Service and so it'll be Albert, Alicia, Maya, who's the um, tribal liaison up in Alaska, and Malia from Hawaii, and just talking about the different perspectives of land acknowledgments. You know, you know, people right now it's kind of almost like a fad that's going around you know, to do these land acknowledgments. But you know, the question you have to think about is, do you really need one? Do you want to do one? If you do. Have you consulted with tribes? You know, all that stuff. So I think um, it's going to be November 9th, and we'll be getting that poster out next week so people can go ahead and sign up for that. But I think that's another critical part of, of how we begin to tell those stories. So.
Do you all have events coming up within uh, your own, Alicia and Albert, do you all have events coming up for for the uh, November? Um, just the one that Dorothy had mentioned. Um, there's a few in the works, but we don't have any dates or anything right now, but when when that is available, we'll be able to get that out and um, see if it's open to the public or if it's just within the National Park Service um, information kind of center. But um, that information will be coming out. We're hoping to do something uh, talking about civil rights, um, the civil rights movement in the South and how um, Native people played a part in that. Because that's not something that is always talked about. And so we want to bring highlight that and have that information out there and there's a lot of histories that are never taught in school or or even in the park service so we're really hoping to change that okay so there's a question that came in that i think albert needs to respond to From, from an archaeological perspective? Well, from an archaeological perspective, we're from, all from Africa. We're all from the Rift Valley. I mean, that's where the matriarch of Homo sapiens sapiens came from. Um, we're all originated from that specific mitochondrial DNA. We all have that part of us. If you look at the archaeological and the physical anthropology side of it. Um, I don't, I don't doubt the Laring, the the Bering Land Bridge, um, but I also don't ascribe to it as the only theory. Um, you know, when you talk to tribal people within anywhere, really anywhere throughout the world, they research they they refer to themselves as the people you know they don't call themselves you know anything else but the people you know are the people are, are they are the people of uh you know whatever i'm lakota so we're pateleate we're the people of the buffalo you know and um and that is where our creation stories start coming from you know Every culture has a creation story, whether it be Adam and Eve um, in the Judeo-Christian era, or even before that, you know, whatever was before that. Um, like for myself, I know where I where I come, where my people came from, and they came from Wayne Cave, which happens to be a national park. So. Um, On the other and the other science aspect of it you know we were classified as mongoloid in the in the 1960s version of human classification because we all have the blue dot and we share that in common with mongols and so were we part of the mongol hordes that ran through you know europe i don't know i think we're still over here in north america in my language we have words for three toed horse. We have words for um rhinoceros the the uh the, <laughs> see, I wanna say furry rhinoceros, but you know we have some of these Pleistocene names um, that are still within the language. Um and so You know, as an archaeologist, I can see it from one side, but as a Native American, I see it from a totally different side. And the whole reason I became an archaeologist was to be to match those two. And I have, in, in my opinion, you know, there are certain places that I know of that um, speak truth to our stories. From an archaeological mm -hmm. perspective, and they're dating around, you know, eleven to twenty thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one of the reasons I'm a human archaeologist. So mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. So yes and yes and no, but yes. <laughs> but, I, you know, and we're talking about telling the stories of Native people in these places. And so when you go back to it, we have our um, origin, you know, the places that we came from. Wind Cave for Lakota, Nakota, Dakota people. I'm here at um, Grand Canyon National Park this week. Two, at least two of the tribes have their um, um, emergence place within the Grand Canyon, Zuni, Pueblo, and Hopi. And, um, and I'm sure there's others because the Havasupai people are from within the Grand Canyon as well. So I think, you know, when you go back to tell these stories, because we're at this level of the world at this time, then that's where you really should start is where um, the people came into this world and start there and, and go forward with those stories. But like I said, we're stuck, you know, we're stuck in the past. And why is that? You know, why do people want to know, you know, do you believe in the Bering Sea land bridge theory rather than how can we help tell the story so that native people are no longer invisible? How do we tell the story so that the 710 native women who disappeared within the last nine years in the state of Wyoming, their stories are told just the same as any other woman that disappears in the state of Wyoming today. You know, we need to start focusing on the present and how it is that we can help tribal people to get those stories out. Thank you, Dorothy. I always teased with Hanako, we always teased each other in college classes that we were land bridge cousins and that we were the connection. <laughs> and um, I say that jokingly just because like, you know, Native people, we also have a practice of, of adopting and, and we have practices that are, that are rooted in relationships and that family, family is, you know, in Lakota, we have several words for family and uh, Albert brought up the, you know, we're the people of the Buffalo, but we also have our, our Tioshpe and our, we also have our Tiwahe and, um, you know, our, our Hunkapi, you know, the, the people that we make it our relatives. And um, those are stories that hold a really important place in those migration movements and the ways that our people have always moved. And so, um, you know, I've heard of Lakota storytellers making their way all the way to like North Carolina and on all the way to Mexico and, um, you know, all the way up into Canada. And um, so I'd like to think that Hanako and I were cousins through the land bridge story, but mostly just because of our stories. <laughs> Well, I think, yeah, I don't, I also don't see any more questions. But thank you again for participating with us. And we really appreciate this opportunity to, to be, be in community. Also, I just want to thank Dorothy and Albert and Alicia for their time. It's been such an honor to meet you all. And thank you for having us on the panel and talking about, you know, the different, or probably more what we have in common with some of the stuff, you know, like with the, um, you know, the um, Japanese American, Asian Americans and African Americans. Because one of the stories, you know, one of our um, um, volunteers at Montezuma Castle in Tusigut um, had gone on to get his uh, master's degree and started really looking into some of the stories that the tribal elders at Yavapai Apache Nation that's, that borders with the parks had talked about um, and went back and really found out so much history about Native American slavery within the United States. And during the Indian Wars, you know, they would kill, you know, come in and massacre the tribal um, um, community that was there, the, the tribal unit that was there. And a lot of times, a lot of the younger children wouldn't have been part of that massacre. So um, then they would pick up those kids and they would take them into the local communities and either sell them to local families or just give them to local families. And they would then be raised as, as um, a slave for that family. And so, I mean, 
so that history also is part of the history that isn't really told and stuff. And so there's just so many different aspects and components of Native American history that can um, be told, you know, along with all of this other stuff too. So, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, a lot of history out there, but then there's also a contemporary stuff that we really need to start beginning to focus on. Thank you. You know, one of the one of the interesting things that I've gotten to do in my career has been going, being able to go to um, at least one internment camp um, when I was in Idaho, and seeing how that was created um, out in the middle of nowhere, um, and seeing the similarities of how it was platted and then doing more research on it. One of the things in the park service that I that I personally do is I try to learn as much information as I can about a site that I'm working at or I'm walk, working near. Um, and, you know, at that particular time, I was actually working on the Oregon Trail um, for a park and doing some delineations and some, and some research for them but um many don't yeah. <laughs> i forgot the one in idaho <laughs> many i thought it was a lakota word at one point but, I can't, but it wasn't <laughs> anyway one of the, one of the, the one in southern idaho um they um i started doing more research into that and that was really surprising um the similarities that that was shown um, when we first came back from um, Canada when Sitting Bulls people came back from Canada they were housed in a military fort um, actually at Fort Buford uh, by Fort Union um, and then they were transferred down to Standing Rock um, and then his people were dispersed actually he wasn't he was transferred all the way down to Fort Randall and spent a few years down there um, as, a, as a captive, but what happened was that we were held in containment, you know, and we were held in containment up until, you know, after World War II. Um, I was having a discussion about um, traditional cultural properties um, and in Indian country earlier today, and one of the things that the Park Service was famous for was saying, oh, it can't be on the Re National Register of Historic Places because you haven't used it continually for, for 50 years. And my response to them was 50 years ago, if we would have left the reservation, we would have been shot as renegades. Plain and simple, you know. And that was within my grandmother's time, you know. And looking at how the setup was and seeing that the barbed wire around the internment camps faced in and the gun turrets faced in um, really hit home with me on that. And I was like, man, you know, I thought we had it rough. Um, and, and, and being torn away from our homes and and things like that, you know, it, it was just a whole cycle of another cycle of, of trauma that's happening to another group of people who did not deserve it whatsoever. Um, and, and it was because they looked different than somebody else. Just like, you know, every other minority person, you know, in, 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 in America at that you know, any time, really. I mean, look at right now what's happening down on the border, you got what's happening with, uh, with the Haitians. You know, they're not even getting a chance to, to claim um, um, uh, what was that called? Anyway, they're not getting a chance to come, yeah, asylum, thank you. <laughs> I mean, getting a chance to claim asylum. They're just getting shipped right back. You know, is that what America is about? You know, 
you know, or you look at, you know, the, the other southern part of the border where you have um, more indigenous people coming up and they're getting turned around the border, you know, and the people are dying today and we're still doing that. The United States government is still doing that, you know. And so, like Alicia said in, in, in the video, that some days it's hard working for the government and seeing what they're doing and seeing that it, it, it's continuing to happen. So, um, you know, that's kind of what I want to end it on. It's just, you know, we've seen it. I've seen it. I felt it. You know, our stories aren't that different. Um, and I hope that, again, as Alicia and Dorothy and, and, and Mel have said that, you know, that the future looks brighter for us. Um, and I truly believe that. I believe that when we start taking ownership of our stories and we start telling the stories the way that they're supposed to be told, you know, unfettered, unfiltered, unbiased, Wow, well, a little bit biased. Um, that we can seriously change the fabric of this country, um, and so that's all inclusive. Seems they talk good. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. I think we're, we'll call it. <laughs> Y'all are good. Good night.